This episode of The Curbsiders is sponsored by the American College of Physicians and National Internal Medicine Day coming up October 28th, 2019. ACP is proud to serve as the professional society for internists, offering their 159,000 members lifelong education, clinical support and guidelines, practice resources, professional development and advocacy. What more could you want from your professional home? For entertainment, education, and information purposes only, and the topics discussed should not be used solely to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any diseases or conditions. For more, the views and statements expressed on this podcast are solely those of those and should not be interpreted to reflect official policy or position of any entity. Aside from possibly cash like more hospital and affiliate outreach programs, if indeed there are any, in fact, there are none. Pretty much, we are responsible to screw up. We should always do your own homework and let's know when we're ready. Hi, everybody. Before we get to the show, I just wanted to quickly remind you that we will be at the CHEST annual meeting this October 2019 in the beautiful New Orleans, Louisiana. We will be recording two live interviews there on stage, plus some recap shows. Please look out for us at the conference wearing our red curbsider shirts. Say hello. Give Paul a hug. Uh, Take a picture with Stuart. We'll have Sarah Phoebe Roberts, our wonderful producer there as well. We are so excited and we hope to see you all there. So welcome back to The Curbsiders. I'm here tonight without Paul and Stuart. I do have a co-host who I will introduce in a second. Tonight we talked about cervical cancer screening and HPV testing, HPV vaccination. Uh, But I wanted to remind you that on this show, this is an internal medicine podcast where we interview the experts to bring you clinical pearls and practice changing knowledge. And as Paul, uh, when he's here, would remind you, we do spend the first few minutes of the show getting to know our guest. You can skip ahead if you want to. There's timestamps in the show notes, but uh, that probably means you're a bad person. So maybe maybe just listen. And now I will introduce our wonderful uh, guest host for tonight, Dr. Molly Hoibline, who's been on like many, many episodes at this point. I don't even think we need to count anymore, Molly. Thanks for having me back, Matt. I don't think I've ever heard you call someone a bad person. So (laughs) those of you who have skipped ahead, feel the cold heart. (laughs) Uh, Why don't don't you tell the audience, uh, maybe you remind them who you are first, and then you can tell them what we talked about a little bit more of the specifics tonight. Sure, yeah. So uh, my name is Molly Hoibly, and I'm a primary care doctor at UCSF, and I specialize in women's health. Um, we had the pleasure of talking with Dr. Karen smith McCune tonight about cervical cancer screening and HPV, and she does a nice job going through the different screening recommendations for different age groups, reviewing human papillomavirus, talking about who should be getting HPV screening, how we should be thinking about how often we should be screening and how we should be screening for cervical cancer. So I think it'll be a helpful and useful episode for all of you out there practicing primary care. And just to let you know a little bit about our guest, her name is Dr. Karen smith McCune. She is the John Kerner Endowed Professor in Gynecologic Oncology in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology and Reproductive Sciences and is the Director of the Dysplasia Clinic at the UCSF Helen Diller Family Comprehensive Comprehensive Cancer Center. It's a bit of a tongue twister, Molly. Uh, It's a long one, yeah. (laughs) Her research interests are focused in abnormal pap smears, cervical precancer, cervical cancer screening, human papillomavirus, and vulvar disease. She has a research interest in the mechanisms by which HPV evades the immune system and establishes precancerous lesions and cancer. Her current research is focused on the effects of contraceptives on the susceptibility of the cervix and endometrium to viral infections, particularly HIV. She recently published an overview of the cervical cancer screening in JAMA, which we refer to on the show, and she was a co-author on a cost-effectiveness analysis of current cervical cancer screening modalities published in JAMA IM. Uh, This was an absolute joy to talk with Dr. McCune, and without a pun, we will proceed to the interview. Unless you want to throw one in, Molly. I don't have one, (laughs) now. Okay, I didn't think so. (laughs) But we will be thinking of Stuart. (laughs) Yes. Karen, can you tell the audience uh, a little bit about yourself? And we always like you to include something you do outside the world of medicine, maybe hobbies or just fun stuff you're doing in life in general. Sure. So I'm a board certified gynecologist and I also do research in the area of HPV. And 
I have two daughters who are in their mid-20s, um, two cats, a dog, and a turtle who lives outside. <laughs> and uh, I like to do um, open water swimming. I have one coming up this weekend in the bay. Nice and cold. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I wear a wetsuit, believe me. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> I'm very impressed. I think I I think it's probably difficult to to learn for some people to learn to swim just in like regular water, you know, pools, let alone open water swimming when it's cold and all that stuff. Did when did you did you pick that up early in life or have you been doing this for 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 years at this point? Are you a pro? Not a pro. Um I started doing it a few years ago when my niece came out to swim from Alcatraz and I was on the boat to support her and I thought this is the coolest thing I've ever seen. Just being outside with the birds and the seals, and it was pretty cool. So I took it up. And okay. I wow. saw it. Awesome. Have you made the Alcatraz trip? Mm hmm. Yep. Wow. Nice. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Highly recommend it. It's fun. Yeah. I think I'd have to up my swimming skills before I'd be ready <laughs> yeah. for something like that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. One of the questions we like to ask our guests is, do you have some good advice, kind of the best advice that you've either heard as a learner or that you like to give as a teacher or that you like to give to your mentees? Oh, um, let's see. When I was a young faculty member and I felt very overwhelmed with all of my responsibilities and I had committed to do too many things, you know, I agreed to write a review for a publication that no one was ever going to read. <laughs> it was something no one had ever heard of. And I heard this advice from the chancellor at the time, and he said, if it's not worth doing, it's not worth doing well. <laughs> and that was just, that just freed me up to uh, get these things off my to-do list in any fashion whatsoever. Excellent. <laughs> One other thing I'd like to ask, I mean, you've done, you've, you've accomplished a lot in your career. And a lot of our guests, I think it's intimidating for people because our guests are are so accomplished. But can you tell us about a time maybe you struggled with something, what you learned from that, and, and maybe how you overcame it? Um, well, I'm still struggling with something. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm trying to make the perfect gluten-free pie crust. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. I was not expecting that answer. <laughs> I am really struggling, but it's fun. Each experiment is very rewarding, but I still haven't got to the perfect pie crust. Okay. Well, if you wanted to share that with us in the audience, once you come up with a recipe, we'd okay. be happy to, I'm sure there's a lot of gluten-free people in our audience. <laughs> sure. Hello, audience. I wanted to remind you all that this October 28th, 2019 is the first annual National Internal Medicine Day. And that is a, a day, a new day, a brand new day that the ACP has established to recognize the unique com contributions of more than 300,000 internal medicine specialists and subspecialists who are committed to providing excellent care for their patients. I am proud to be an internist. You know why I'm proud? I am proud because we take care of the patients that are old, that are sick, that are complex, that other patient, that other specialties don't want to take care of. So don't complain when your, your colleagues try to drop these patients in your lap. You should be flattered that they think you can take care of such complexity as an internist. So ACP also wants to hear why you're proud to be an internist. Use the hashtag I am proud or hashtag National Internal Medicine Day and be sure to tag at ACP Internus on social media and answer any of these questions. What makes you proud to practice internal medicine or one of the I am subspecialties? What recent practice uh, patient experiences made you proud to be an internist or subspecialist? And how is internal medicine unique from other subspecialties? If you submit your answer at ACP online, dot org forward slash I am proud. You will be eligible for one of three prizes that will be given out between now and June of 2020. So don't forget to tag ACP internists on social. Use the hashtags I am proud and hashtag national internal medicine day. And you will be eligible to win the first round of prizes, which will be announced on national internal medicine day this October 28th, 2019. And now, Molly, if you would like to give us a case from CashLack, and we can start talking about cervical cancer screening and HPV. 
Absolutely. So we have Nina. She's a 44-year-old healthy woman with a history of normal pap smears, and she's coming in for her annual exam. She is transferring care from an out-of-state provider and has been getting yearly pap smears in the past, and she wonders if you're going to do her pap today. So let's just take a step backward and talk kind of in the broader sense about human papillomavirus or HPV and why that's important for us to know and um, just kind of some, some details about what primary care providers should understand about HPV. Sure. So um, in around the late 80s, we discovered that HPV was present in over 95% of cervical cancers. And um, so it seems to be a necessary um, pre precursor to the development of cancer. But luckily, most of the time when women have an HPV infection, um, nothing happens. Their body clears it, and we never even know that it was was there. And if you test serologically, about 80% of adults in the U.S. have evidence of having had the HPV infection. And obviously, most of them don't develop any clinical manifestations that we ever know about. Um, how does it do that? It has two um, genes that drive the cell into some kind of proliferative state that's not normal. And um, it's a ra- like I said, it's a rare event. We don't understand the conditions that result in that event. There's probably genetic overlay. We're not sure. But in rare instances, when people get the, the infection with the virus, they develop um, changes on the cervix that could lead to cancer. Molly was mentioning this to me in pre-recording, and I thought it was just like, I thought it was an interesting thing. It's kind of in like popular culture on TV shows. People sort of shame other people for having HPV as like a sexually transmitted infection. Um, Is it, how do you, how do you think of it? Do you consider this to be like an STI or is it just sort of like, what, I mean, how do you recommend we counsel patients when they come to us like freaking out? I have an STI, I have an HPV. What what do I do about this? Mm-hmm. Yeah, good question. You know, technically it is a sexually transmitted infection, but it's so common that it's it's really, I think, unfair to give it that stigma. It's kind of like how many people have had hand warts or plantar warts, very common, and that doesn't have the same sort of stigma HPV can infect many different body parts, and there is a subtype of HPV that happens to infect the genital skin, and it's skin-to-skin transmission. So basically, if you have sex, you're at risk of having exposure to the HPV uh, virus. But it's so common that I, I really hate that label, and I don't use it in my practice. I just say it's a common viral infection that most adults are exposed to. That's basically what I try to tell patients, too, that it's sort of similar to the common cold, but once in a while it does stick around and we need to follow up on it. But it it can be difficult for patients to hear that and kind of think about what they should tell their partners or not tell their partners or or how to think about that moving forward. Absolutely. Yeah, it really does open up the can of worms because even though it's a very common, usually innocuous virus, it is acquired by genital skin to genital skin contact. So it does have that overlay of being a so sort of so sexually transmitted infection. So it does make it it does make it very fraught for a lot of patients. Yeah, so so getting back to our case of Nina, um, you know, how do how do we think about counseling her about when she needs her next pap smear? There have been a lot of changes in recommendations in the last five to ten years since we've understood that HPV screening can be integrated into pap smear screenings. Um, could you give us a brief description of the current screening guidelines um, for this age group, so age 30 to 65? Sure. So we used to do PAPS annually, and lots and lots of evidence has shown that that's over-screening. We're more likely to pick up nonspecific changes. So um, even without HPV in the equation or HPV testing as part of screening, just the pap smear alone the intervals have increased over the last 10 years. We went we went from being annual to them saying every two to three years, and now it's a hard and fast three years. You shouldn't do PAPS more often than every three years. Because of our new information about HPV as the sort of causative agent, there are new screening um, tests that incorporate 
testing for HPV um, into the screening algorithms. And so the most recent iteration of the um, algorithms came out in 2018, just last year. And the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force has said you can do cytology every three years or you can do a, a HPV alone primary screen every five years. And the reason for that difference is the sensitivity. The uh, HPV test is much more sensitive if you are negative. It has a very high negative predictive value, and you can wait five years before you rescreen. Um, the pap smear, not so good, not as good, so the interval is shorter, three years um, before you do your next. Uh, if you have a negative pap, you only need another one in three years. Uh, so those were the two that they, the two screening algorithms that they uh, said are preferred. Also acceptable is the co-test, which is what we've been doing m most commonly in this age group up until recently, which is a combination of a PAP and an HPV test. So, and that again is every five years. I wonder, so you can, oh, I was going to say, I wondered if we could talk a little bit about the specifics of how the tests are collected and, and mm -hmm. with the HPV test, what exactly is it testing for? Sure. So for the cytology, if you're just going to do cytology alone, you can do it as a liquid-based test, or you can do the old conventional smear onto the slide, the one that we used to do before we got liquid-based cytology. The task force has said that they're equivalent. So um, I think the horse is already out of the barn in terms of most of us have converted to liquid, but if you haven't converted yet, there's no compelling reason to do so. And it's a lot less expensive to do the conventional PAP. In terms of the HPV test, though, you need the liquid test. So if you're going to do some form of HPV testing, you're going to need to do the sample that's collected into the bottle of liquid. And there's two different products that you can that do this. Um, and it goes to the lab, and either part of it is taken out for cytology, if you're doing a co-test, and then the remainder goes to the lab for PCR testing. And it's testing for between 13 and 14 HPV types that are considered the high risk types. There is a, an available test that looks for the low risk types. These are the types that would be commonly found in genital warts, but nobody recommends using that test. That test should, shouldn't be considered because it doesn't affect clinical management in any way. We do want to know if the high risk virus is there because that woman is at slightly higher risk of something happening down the road. Um, so the test that we all use is for a high risk HPV cocktail. And then you can also, with most tests nowadays, you can carve out what we call genotyping to test for two of the highest risk types, HPV 16 and 18. So that's kind of complicated answer to I tell yeah. you what you well maybe know? maybe we can, I can try to summarize and then you yeah. when I fall short you can kind of correct sure with the traditional cytology that's what you, was the papalikin papa nicolau smear the pap smear and yeah. that's where you're using a spatula or a brush to collect cells from the ectocervix endocervix and with the eight high risk HPV test is it pretty much similar where you, you collect it in the same way? It, 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 do you need to do use like a different instrument to collect if um, you're co-testing? If, if you're collecting into liquid, one of the two products sells a specific collection device. It looks like a little broom, uh -huh. a latex or plastic broom that um, you use to collect the sample. And the other product, it just um, same, same old, same old plastic spatula, brush that goes inside the cervix, and both of those instruments go into the liquid. For both the types of, of collection, you do need to then get the cells off of the collection device into the liquid, which mm -hmm. has they have different methods of doing that. Um, and then you throw away the collection device in one case or leave it in the bottle in another case and cap the bottles and send them to the lab. Okay. And from that bottle, they can make both a liquid cytology slide, not liquid, a cytology slide, and or they can test the liquid by PCR for the high-risk HPV types. And then the 16 and 18, which are the highest risk types, mm -hmm. was that also sent from the same liquid? Mm -hmm. Okay. 
from the same liquid. If you indicate you want to get that information, um, they just run, they expand the panel of testing that they do. And actually in our lab at UCSF, you don't even have an option. You just get all that information. Do they have 16? Yes, no. Do they have 18? Yes, no. Do they have any of the other 12 types? Yes, no. So you don't have to choose to ask for genotyping it's given to you automatically but in other with other products you I, they either run a sort of generic umbrella test and or they run a specific test for the high risk for those yeah. the, those two types so you might you might get a test result that says they have high risk types but it might not specify if those were 16 mm-hmm. or 18 and in yes. those cases well i guess i don't would it matter to if you know they have a high risk would would you need to still send 16 or 18 on top of that? Is that going to be helpful in, in, in situations? There's one scenario where it is helpful, which is if you send a co-test, so that's a PAP and an HPV combo, and you get the result that the PAP is normal, but the high-risk HPV is positive. This is one of those conundrum management things where, ugh, you know, that combination of results really doesn't have a very high positive predictive value, but it's high enough that they shouldn't go, just go back to five-year screening. Okay. They have Something has to happen. So you have the option of just saying, come back in a year and we'll do the test again. Or you could say, let's see if you have 16 and 18 and or 18. If you do, you send them to colposcopy because those one of those type, either of those types is, has a higher positive predictive value for having underlying disease. Okay. So that's a scenario where having the 1618 is useful. And I have to say, getting the results in every situation, which is what our lab does, I think it sort of confuses people and scares people because we really most of the time we don't really need to know if they have 16 or 18. The only time it's useful is, as I said, when they're you're doing a co-test and they have both um, a normal PAP and an HPV positive test. There's another situation where it's useful. Do you want to hear about that? Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> okay. So the other, um, I said the task force has recently endorsed primary HPV testing. So their two preferred screening modalities are just do the PAP every three years or do an HPV test every five years. So as you can see that co-testing thing that I've been talking about. That's kind of falling by the wayside now. It's kind of falling down by the wayside because it's very sensitive, but it's not as specific. You get more noise because you're doing two tests. And they feel like primary HPV screening is essentially just as sensitive as the co-test, and it doesn't give you as much noise. So in the setting where you're going to just do HPV testing as your screen, um, again, knowing if there's 16 or 18 positive is useful because those women will go straight to colposcopy. The women who are high risk HPV positive, but not with 16 or 18, there's a whole lot of around the world, a whole lot of discussion about how to manage those women. But most of us agree that they probably don't need to go straight to colposcopy. They probably need some kind of surveillance, like follow up in a year or do cytology. So a reflex cytology maybe is the right thing to do. That happens to be what the um, recommendation, the only body in the U.S. that has made a recommendation has come out and said we should look for 16, 18. If it's positive, go straight to Culpo. If it's negative, do cytology. And if it's abnormal cytology at any level, doesn't matter what the cytology is, they should get colposcopy. So complicated, huh? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Molly, how do we navigate this? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I, I guess, I, so you've kind of narrowed it down to there, according to the United States Preventative Service Task Force, there's two preferred options, and that would be every three-year cytology alone or every five-year HPV alone, and an optional version to co-test every five years. So it sounds like we should probably be switching to one of those first two if we're not already doing those. Um, do you how, how do you think different clinicians choose between those options or why might certain patients be better candidates for one of those options over another? I think it really comes down to p- patient's comfort level with the interval. You know, like our patient that you presented was used to every year and for some people, stretching out to every three is, it's challenging. 
they feel uncomfortable, they feel like um, unsafe. Um, so going to a test that's every five might be even more of a push for them. But I think in younger women who aren't used to ever having had every year testing, the idea of just needing something every five years versus every three years is appealing. So that's one way I think of it is what's, you know, what's the patient's comfort level with the intervals? What, what do they feel about less is more or more is better or whatever? Um, so. I thought it was interesting in the, in the article that you wrote, I guess it was just this, it was this year, right? In JAMA, the, yes. it, it was talking about the shared decision-making and how that can be a bit challenging. And one of the things that you wrote in there was that the, the number needed to test for HPV to prevent one case that wouldn't have been picked up with cytology is about a thousand. So you need to test a thousand women to pick up one additional case of cervical cancer and it's just really hard to, even for clinicians maybe, to to understand that and internalize it, let alone explain it to a patient in like a 10 or 15 minute visit. So what's right. kind of your spiel when you're talking to patients about, let's say it's, a, I mean, our patient here, like what might be your spiel to her when you're trying to discuss with her about which testing route to choose? Um, so... I do come back to the fact that HPV testing is very sensitive, but most of the time when you have it, nothing is wrong. And the the likelihood of ending up needing colposcopy in, how old was our patient? 44. 44. Okay, well, that's not so bad. In a 30-year-old, someone between the age of 30 and 35, the likelihood of her having an HPV positive test is about 10%. So that's a lot of you know, noise in a system where her likelihood of getting cancer, like you said, it's, it's a rare disease in the first place in well-screened women. So our, our goal isn't even to prevent or to detect cancer. It's to prevent cancer by detecting the precursor lesions. And those are rare events. So, um, so in a, in a 40 year old, I would tell her that, you know, there, there is a chance the test is going to come back positive and nothing is wrong. And you will be placed into a, a situation of surveillance, which might in, end up with interventions. The same is true, though, of cytology, because we have a category called ASCUS that also leads people into this gray zone of, of what's going to happen to me. Um, so they both have their downsides. Um, I, I had an easier time counseling people away from co-testing, because there the specificity was low enough that the likelihood they were going to end up in some kind of surveillance was was pretty high with very little gain. Um, so did that answer your question? I kind of lost well, my train of thought on this. Yeah. I, I, so it's it sounds like so it sounds like the easy point is getting them away from co testing, and then mm -hmm. for f maybe for a woman who's thirty to thirty five. It sounds like the conversation is a little different because they have a one in ten chance of having having a positive HPV test, and then they might end up going for an intervention, as you said, like especially if it's right. sixteen or eighteen is found. And then for 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 older women, maybe the risk. It sounds like maybe the risk is a little bit lower if they're getting mm -hmm. this this HPV test. And mm -hmm. when you're talking about when you're talking about going to colposcopy, how do you explain to them? Like, let's say this woman, our 44-year-old Nina, gets, she has a high-risk HPV positive and she's going to go for colposcopy. How do you explain to her like what that's going to be like for her? Uh, so it's an intervention uh, where we, we start out as if we're doing a pap smear. We put a speculum in, we visualize the cervix, and then we bathe the cervix with different liquids to look for color changes that might dictate the active HPV infection. Uh, if she's just coming in because she had a positive HPV test, the likelihood we're going to find something is pretty low, like 4%. So I, I give them an, a, a number that isn't necessarily 4%, but it's low, less than 1 in 10, that we're going to find something that we need to treat ultimately. Uh, but it gives us the reassurance that we're not missing uh, something. If we do need to be um, in, invasive a little bit and do a biopsy, there's a you know, a short interval of discomfort. Sometimes it's very sharp and painful. Sometimes it's just uh, 
an odd feeling on their cervix and there can be bleeding afterwards, but that's pretty rare. And then we send those specimens to the lab and we find out what the HPV has or hasn't done on the surface of the cervix and whether there's anything there that could become cancer if we didn't do something about it. If there is, we will have her come back and we'll do treatments. And is there anything that we as primary care physicians should be aware of in terms of long-term risks of any of the treatments in terms of fertility or premature labor or any, any other complications that can arise from a leap or other cervical treatments? Yeah, there, there's a fairly significant body of knowledge now that LEAP appears to be associated with a slightly increased risk of preterm labor. Um, if the underlying risk is about 10% of a pregnant woman having a preterm birth, after LEAP it goes up to 17%. So it's not a, you know, it's just barely twofold, not even. Depends on the study. And Interestingly, in the United States, most of the studies that have been done haven't shown that increase in risk. Most of the data that shows it are from Europe, where we think they just use larger instruments and take out more of the normal cervix. But because there's a chance of that happening, um, we try, if possible, to do other types of techniques that are more ablative in nature rather than excisional. So we freeze the cervix or we laser it, if possible, um, to sort of avoid the risk. Nobody's ever been able to show a risk of changes in fertility, uh, but some recent data has showed that after LEAP, um, there's probably a higher risk of miscarriage in the first six to 12 months after the procedure. Um, So it's, my personal opinion is the data isn't yet strong enough to counsel women against getting pregnant in the six to 12 months after I do a LEAP, but um, I think it's, it's worth mentioning it to them and letting them factor it into their their lifestyle and what their plans are for pregnancy. If she's 40 years old, I, I don't think it's reasonable to ask her to wait a year after at least to get pregnant just to avoid the theoretical risk of a miscarriage. So those are the three primary, definite, well, probable increased risk of preterm labor, no effect on fertility, and possible increased risk of miscarriage after a leap. And since we're talking about colposcopies and treatment, and most of these will happen in younger women, previously we were just talking about that 30 to 65 age range. What about in women younger than 30? What are the recommendations for screening there? So in in that age group, because of the high prevalence of HPV, um, no HPV testing is recommended. So they only have one option for screening, and that's cytology every three years. And is there any reason to start screening before age 21? Nope. Only in, there's one age, one high risk group, HIV infected individuals um, should start screening when they become sexually active, whatever the age or at 21 um, at the latest. So, but everybody else, the recommendation is to not screen before the age of 21 because cervical cancer under that age is just not seen. And we see so much HPV infection that we end up having to do a lot of culpos and biopsies and potentially treatments. Um, for a biological situation that will usually resolve on its own. Mm-hmm. Along these same lines, when and we were just talking about some of the situations and, and what testing would follow it, is there, let's say you're a, a primary care doc, you're in clinic, you're seeing patients and or you're just kind of going through your lab results, your inbox, mm-hmm. is there an app you pull up and say, okay, this person had this test, and they're this demographic, so I need to, to follow it up with this. Like, is there mm-hmm. an easy resource we can point the audience to? There's a resource. I'm not sure it's easy. Okay. It's the, it's the ASCCP website, and there is an app that you can also purchase from them. ASCCP stands for the American Society of Colposcopy and Cervical Pathology, and they're the ones that sort of um, made up the algorithms for what to do with abnormal results. And um, they have a series of algorithms to follow. Um, the reason I say they're not the most easy is that sometimes they take you down an algorithm that then you end up having to go to another algorithm <laughs> to figure out what you're supposed to do. So um, it's not, it's, I wouldn't say it's easy, but it's pretty complete. Um I do know, so they, they just posted the draft of their next round of recommendations that are going to incorporate more data about HPV testing. And um, 
they're not going to have the um, like the algorithms on their uh, website are both printed and you can also use the app to sort of get to them. Uh, they're not going to, it's all going to be um, app based now, or it's all going to be what I want to say. You're going to plug in all the variables and then they're going to tell you what to do. So there's not going to be a flow sheet to follow. It's just going to. That sounds easier. Yeah. It sounds easier. Yeah. <laughs> we just need, yeah. I mean, I have, we just need that. It's just like, there's no point in committing this to memory at this point. Um, no, it's too complicated. No, it, I agree. This is what I do for a living. And there's many <laughs> times when I'm confused and I have to look at the algorithm. <laughs> I think it would be helpful, though, and I, I definitely agree that listeners don't need to commit all of it to memory, but just to kind of go through the sort of the, the three most common things that you will see on a PAP report, if it is an abnormal, and kind of what those mean and how you would counsel a patient about those. Sure. So the most abnormal is ASCUS, a typical squamous cells of undetermined significance on a PAP. And we see that in, depends on the lab, but 5 to 10% of PAP results. And um, you kind of have three options for managing it. One is just repeat it in a year. And the second is do HPV testing. It, that, that would be called reflex HPV testing, where you, you just ask the lab to run HPV if it's ASCUS. And if you get a positive HPV with an ASCUS pap, their likelihood of having an abnormality at colposcopy is greater than 4%. So it, it's above the culpo threshold. What we say the culpo threshold is the point at which you say, okay, that test result combination is predictive enough of disease that they need to come in for colposcopy. If on the other hand, they have ASCUS, but the HPV is negative, their likelihood of underlying disease is pretty much the same as someone who has a negative PAP. So that's why we say come back in three years, because that's what our interval is for someone with a negative PAP. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, I usually counsel people that ask us is a very common, nonspecific, abnormal, not even, ab I don't use that word, finding where the cells are slightly tweaked, but the normal vaginal microflora can make that happen. Um, Recent intercourse can make that happen, and sometimes it's related to HPV. And so that's why we follow them closely, or that's why we go to colposcopy. But most of the time, we don't find anything concerning. And the other situation, you so there's ASCUS, and what other what other findings might they report on a on a cytology report? On the cytology, the next most common finding is low grade. SIL, LSIL stands for squamous intraepithelial lesion, and it can be low grade LSIL or high grade HSIL. But LSIL is much more common than HSIL. And it's similar kind of to ask us HPV positive. When someone has LSIL on a PAP, just the way the cells look, they are viral factories. So it means they have a viral infection. You don't need to run an HPV test because you know they have HPV. Could be low risk, could be high risk type, doesn't matter. Um, the likelihood of finding of them having something that's significant is above the culpo threshold. So they get sent for colposcopy. Um, if you happened to send a co-test and you found out they were HPV negative, you can kind of let that one go and say, you don't need culpo, but we need you to come back in a year and we'll repeat the testing and see if your, um, if your, in fact, if your abnormal PAP resolves. And obviously, if they're high-risk HPV negative and they have a low cell, l cell PAP, they probably have an infection with a low-risk HPV type, which is, again, not clinically significant. So we just let them let them disappear for a year and hopefully get rid of the infection and come back for another PAP in a year. So those are the two most common. And as you can tell, they're, they're basically noise, right? They're not very predictive of disease. We only find underlying precancer in a small fraction of them and fewer than five to 10% of the people with those PAP smear results. Um, okay. And so that's, so that those are the, those are the main PAP results we might see on a pap smear most commonly. And then when they're actually, you're doing the biopsy, that's where you you talk about the cervical intraepithelial uh, or the CIN, one, two, three. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. When we do a biopsy, we're looking for histological evidence 
of HPV infection, and that's called cervical intraepithelial neoplasia, one, two, three, right? We only treat two and three. We leave one alone because it's like having LCL on a pap. It's a sign that they have active HPV, but we hope that it'll resolve. And about 80% of active HPV infections disappear in one to two years. So we do definitely have the benefit of, you know, letting them go away and hopefully come back next year and have it be gone. When I trained, we didn't understand the natural history as well. And so we used to treat all CINs, regardless, one, two, or three, with some kind of excisional or cryotherapy. So I'm glad we've moved into a state where we can, you know, let the CIN ones um, go about their way and not <laughs> active <treat>. surveillance. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. I, I want to just try to recap, and then we have a couple more topics that we wanted to hit on. It, so we said under 21, we're not testing unless they have HIV. And mm-hmm. then between uh, under age 30, uh, between 21 and 30, uh, I know there's there's a little bit differing recommendations maybe from different, but it's more, it's a cytology every three years as long as they're mm-hmm. normal. And yep. then uh, from 30 to 65, we talked about the two, the two pathways we're now recommending are either cytology every three years or HPV every five years. And Correct. the co-tests were kind of pushing to the wayside. Yeah. So what I'm Although- leading, oh, go on. I was going to say, I think a lot of systems have finally sort of got the co-test down. Yeah. So when the task force first posted their draft of their recommendations, they said not to do co-testing. Okay. They just, were, they were going to drop it. And there was public outcry. The final, <laughs> there was huge public outcry, like, what? Uh-huh. We just figured this out. <laughs> so they, they left it in. So I think, I think we should... We should say that some people are going to do co-testing. That that's called a sunk cost fallacy, where you, uh, <laughs> you even when something is no longer makes sense to do, you you you're like, I invested so it. much in this, I got to keep doing it. <laughs> well, okay. So where I was leading was now at 65. I was taught that if if it's a woman who's 65 and she's had testing her whole life and it's always been normal, we can stop. But Molly was telling me that's controversial. So can you talk to us a little bit about that? Because we have a lot, a lot of people now living longer and healthier mm-hmm. lives. So what what do we do with those people? Well, I didn't realize it was controversial. Molly, do you want to talk? <laughs> well, I guess what Matt and I were talking about was that it, they, I think all the societies uh, agree in the United States that, that it's reasonable to stop testing at 65. Um, but I, I think I had read that in some countries that is not the situation um, and that there's there's some research that maybe the rates of cervical cancer in women over 65 look artificially low because more women have had hysterectomies, um, which kind of led out of a a discussion between Matt and I about what a partial hysterectomy is and how you make sure they do or do not have a cervix. But <laughs> no, it, it is true that the drop in the rates of cervical cancer that were seen after the introduction of pap smear screening didn't take into account hysterectomy as a cofactor. So um, it may have made the pap look artificially more wonderful than it is. But I think there's pretty universal agreement in developed countries that um, – if woman is well screened, the likelihood that she's going to get a new HPV infection and develop cancer after the age of 65 is so low that it's not worth the resources. And the resources that occur are, again, from all the false positives, the ASCAS PAPs, the low-grade PAPs, the HPV-positive testing. Um, so there's pretty, I, I think the task force said it was a D recommendation, did not. And it's- it's just so much more unpleasant for postmenopausal women that thankfully we don't need to put them through it. So, absolutely, yeah. It, so, if you were, if you had the situation, if Nina was a sixty-five-year-old female seeing you in clinic, and she'd maybe, maybe she'd stop testing at age fifty-five, and they'd been normal, what might you, how might you handle that, and what, what, when, if you decided you were going to do a a test at this time, when might you stop? When might it be safe to stop? Um, so you have to have had either three negative cytology tests or two negative co-tests. And I guess that also means two negative HPV tests within the past 10 years to stop. So she wouldn't, she'd need to keep going even For another though 10 years, Uh huh. Okay. for at least two more cycles of screening. 
okay. two or three, depending on which test you chose. Yeah. And then you just cross your fingers. I mean, I know so many people who say, oh, I'm going to do a co-test in this situation because then, you know, we can really get more, you know, get out further. And then the HPV is positive. And then you're condemned mm -hmm. to all kinds of like, you know, <laughs> oh my God. anxiety and follow up. And <laughs> yeah, I guess. Yeah, you toss the coin. And if she's negative, negative, it's very reassuring. She only has to have one more test in five years and then she's done. Can Can I just ask you one more question? Because this did, this was something that came up not uncommonly for me. If you have a woman who's like 63 and she mm -hmm. has, you know, it just falls that she's getting either a cytology or a HPV, high risk HPV at age 63 and it's negative she gets, she's done at that point. Like you don't have to be like, well, you weren't exactly like you're that next, that normal cycle will take her past 65. And if she's been normal to that point, you just stop or at yeah, least in the last had, 10 years. Yeah. If she's had within the last 10 years. Yeah. I'm, I interpret it to mean that she is done. Molly, do you, do you also? That's what I do as well. Yeah. Yeah. So okay. I'm glad to have your backup. <laughs> <laughs> is is there any movement towards HPV testing being vaginal rather than cervical? Oh, it's a great question. And I'm hoping that yeah. we'll move to that. I yet. think if women could do self swabs, that would really open up a lot of the population who has trouble getting pap smears or is really uncomfortable getting them. And yeah, it would, it would, it would really extend our ability to screen the underscreened because a lot of mm -hmm. the underscreened are just reluctant to have the test. And in Europe, they're using it quite um, aggressively to capture people who have been like with socialized medicine and they can track who hasn't come in for their test. They send them a swab and have them send the swab back. It's been very successful. But as of today, the FDA hasn't approved any of the um, tests for self-collection. So we're, we're just going to have to wait for that. I wanted to say one more thing about HPV testing, if I could. Yeah, absolutely. So, the primary HPV testing. So that's the only test you're going to do. The FDA has only approved two tests for that indication um, because maybe it's three. But anyway, the, the, the thing you need to check with your lab is does the test have an internal standard for specimen adequacy? So with the PAP, we know we get cells or they say insufficient sample, right? If you um, have a, a test that doesn't tell you whether there's hemoglobin gene there or some other internal marker, then you might get a false negative HPV negative test. And that would be not very reassuring if you're going to say, oh, it's negative, come back in five years. So there currently are two products on the market that don't have any internal standards for specimen adequacy, and they are not FDA approved for primary HPV screening. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That is good to know. Mm -hmm. So I think we probably have time for just a, a couple more questions. Um, so the the things, just as, just to give you a heads up what's coming, I, I definitely wanted to ask, Molly asked about the partial hysterectomy thing. I think we should mm -hmm. definitely just answer that. That shouldn't, I imagine that's an easy answer for you. And we wanted to just talk about the H, HPV vaccination recommendation that was recently sort of upgraded uh, or updated, I should say. I don't know if it was an upgrade. Mm -hmm. And I think that's it from my perspective. Molly, was there any yeah. other ones that you wanted to ask about? No, I, th I think kind of spending the majority of the next five minutes on the HPV vaccine would be great. Great. Um, so just a quick word about hysterectomy. If a woman's had a hysterectomy and it wasn't uh, done for cervical dysplasia or precancer, she doesn't need any more screening. So that's an important um, thing, but if she still has a cervix, the partial hysterectomy is where they take the uterus out and they leave the cervix behind. Then she still needs regular screening. She, mm -hmm. It's as if she never had a hysterectomy. I think the partial hysterectomies are pretty uncommon nowadays. They went through a phase of popularity about ten years ago, where a lot of women were having them. It seems to have dropped out of fashion for some reason. So, but it's important to ask if they don't know. Um, what kind of hysterectomy they had. Sometimes you can send them for ultrasound and ask, is there a cervix there or not? If you can't see it, you know, sometimes it's really hard to tell. It feels like there's one in there, but there's so much buckling around the apex of the vagina, you can't really find an os. It's really hard. It can be hard to know. But you can do an ultrasound. And if they've had, if it was done for a precancerous reason and the cervix was taken, 
do you then are you doing sort of like a speculum exam and looking at the the surgical like the area where the cervix used to be for like vaginal lesions or you do a pap test or an hpv test of the vagina okay you can have vaginal precursors and vaginal cancer but um it's rare so you can't stop screening them is the point so you have to do surveillance for about 20 years, and then they can eventually exit from screening when they've been negative. Okay. Um, so it's like, like every re- three years, it's like mm-hmm. some sort of a, a, a vaginal swab for, for mm-hmm. cells? Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Okay. Cool. Okay. Um, so the HPV vaccine was recently the non-avalent vaccine against nine um, HPV types, two low-risk types and seven high-risk types. Um, The FDA recently approved it for vaccination in women 26 to 45 years old. Um, They had denied that labeling on the original, based on the original results from one of the trials, maybe it was about 10, it was a while ago now, eight to 10 years ago. Um, And they asked for more follow-up data. And so the follow-up data was provided and they gave the labeling indication in October of last year. And just last month, the um, ACIP finally came out with their guidance about um, vaccinating that age group. It looks like from the notes that I can see online from the ACIP meeting in April, it was very contentious. There was a large contingent of people on the committee who wanted to make uh, no recommendation. They just they thought it wasn't cost effective. They are concerned about the supply chain. Apparently, the The vaccine is in high demand, and they were concerned about it siphoning off into this group of worried well. So there was a, you know, a a contingent from what I can read uh, between the lines um, from what was posted. uh, There was a group that was very much against it. There was a group that was very for it. And they ended up sort of ducking. So the recommendation is not a recommendation. It's called shared decision making. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> that seems to be a popular theme right now. <laughs> is that right? It's yeah. So frustrating. What does that even mean? But it's, anyway. Uh, yeah. We, it's, it's like an internal medicine th- thing, I think, where you yeah. basically, you're just like, you tell the patient, you're like, you, you're an autonomous person. I'm going to present you with information and you tell me what you want to do. We'll make the decision together. But uh, as but most- But neither of us understand these statistics and- <laughs> Yeah. I can't tell you if this will help you or not. Yeah. Right. It's right. tough. Yeah, it's very tough. Um, I think the reason, so the old in the old days when there was that sort of intermediate recommendation from ACIP, the insurance companies could deny coverage. So they changed the wording of it, and they, they call it shared decision-making so that if you order it, the insurance company basically has to pay for it. So oh. that's helpful. That's good. Yeah. Um, but they didn't provide very much guidance about who is likely to benefit. So who is that? It would be a woman who's probably had not, not had too many sex partners. Someone who's in a monogamous relationship probably has no need for it, but maybe a 35 year old who's recently divorced, didn't have a lot of sexual exposure when she was younger and is about to, you know, enter the dating scene. She's a reasonable candidate for HPV vaccination. Um, Someone who's had, Many, many life partners has been treated for high grade dysplasia. Um, she wasn't somebody that was studied in the trial. The trial excluded people who had had a history of HPV infection in the past. And um, even excluding those, the trial showed benefit, but very pretty marginal benefit. So I think we can say that a woman who's clearly been very sexually active in her life, exposed probably and has had documented medical exposure, um, she's probably not going to benefit. And to clarify, so uh, the presumption is that those women have had multiple strains and cleared them and then cannot get the same strain again? Yes. So once you've had one strain, you you won't get the same again. Okay. You're protected. Oh, Mm -hmm. yeah. I hadn't thought about, I didn't thought about that perspective of it. And, And just to kind of Reading about the HPV vaccination, first of all, I love the term sexual debut, which is what they 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 say, like, you know, you want to get it in there before someone makes their sexual debut, which I thought was like, you know, mm-hmm. just interesting wording. 
Uh, yeah. And in general, it's starting as early as age nine, but it seems like around age 11 to 13 is when they yes. they think is like the sweet spot. And the, exactly. there's there there's less less injections required if they get it early because they're more, I guess their immune systems are more reactive, but then they there's a three injection regimen if you get it above age 15 or- Above I, age 15, yeah. Yeah. And, 15 and or older. Or older, 15 so or older. So up to the age of 14, they only need two, and this was a huge breakthrough because it was pretty hard to get moms to bring kids in at zero, two, and six months, which is the, you know, the interval that's appropriate. Um, there's a lot of data showing that two and two shots is very effective. WHO has recommended two shots as their um, preferred, you know, in, um, schedule. And what they're trying to do, so if you if you give some uh, a kid one shot, the next shot should be no sooner than six months and up to a year. So they can end up getting it on an annual platform, which is oh. so much easier. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, I, yeah. that's that's great. Yeah. So it's just like convenient. They'll be there for their annual and you just They'll give it to them. They're away. They get their second shot. They're done. So that was a huge breakthrough. Um, and you're right. The 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 group that is absolutely going to benefit are the people who are sexually naive. So that's why it's targeted. Eleven to twelve year olds is sort of the target population, as young as nine and up to the age of fourteen. That group can get two shots at um, six months or more interval, and they're done, which is yeah fantastic. Yeah. And I thought it was interesting. Your your paper was kind of speculating, like at this time we still do the same kind of screening for these folks, but maybe in the future we'll have data that suggests like if you were adequately vaccinated before you made your sexual debut, then maybe you don't even need uh, pap testing at all. That would be pretty cool. Right. And the ex- the expectation that there's going to be a huge cohort of vaccinated people entering the screener population makes HPV primary screening look very efficient, right? Because mm-hmm. if they're vaccinated, there aren't going to be very many positives. So the the downsides that I spent some time talking about a few minutes ago of HPV testing are going to be gone, really, because yeah. most people aren't going to be um, positive. Right. And the ones that are positive are more likely probably to have disease. Yeah. So it is going to make an impact. It, we're not there yet, but you know, there's lots of surveillance data that's developing and being published. And eventually um, we'll have enough information to stratify screening by your vaccination history. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Is there a, a better uptake? I know I don't follow adolescents too closely, but I know it was hard to get families to sign on. Has that improved? Yeah, it's creeping up. I think the last statistic I saw was 65% uptake, which okay. is it's Pretty going good. up. Yeah. yeah. And I would expect that with the two shot once a year thing, it's going to be much, much easier. Mm-hmm. I think a lot of the um, the so-called poor uptake was looking at how many people had had the full three shots. And um, and there's actually there's research going on now to look at protection with just one shot. There appears to be some. So oh, interesting. Yeah. Cool. Well, I promised that I would let you go around this time now. So the the last question I want to ask you is, can you give us some take home points that you wanted our our audience to recommend uh, to remember? Remember, these are internists. So, and if you also wanted to just point out, like, please stop doing this, internist, it's driving me crazy. <laughs> you can throw that in as well. We love those. You love those. Um, I think the the key take home is if you're going to do HPV testing. It should be no often than every five years. I think that's the biggest glitch I see in the screening is that people are getting co-tested every year. Whoa, that's like <laughs> way too much testing. So um, that's one big take home is um, HPV based testing is only it's really good. It's very sensitive and you're very safe doing it only every five years. Um And if you're doing cytology, I think we're all moving to that. I think we're getting more and more comfortable with it, but it's every three years, not every year. (laughs) All right. Anything you'd like to plug before we let you go? Any websites or just any any of your work that you'd like people to look out for? No, just keep doing what you're doing. (laughs) Front lines there. (laughs) That's right. We are front lines. All right. Thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure. I think our listeners will really learn a lot. Thank you. Thank you.
This has been another episode of The Curbsiders, bringing you a little knowledge food for your brain hole. Yummy. <laughs> I was wondering if you were going to go for it. <laughs> I wouldn't usually, but since Stuart's not here, i got to gotta represent. Much, yeah, I pretty much forced you into it. Uh, get show notes at thecurbsiders.com forward slash podcast and sign up for our mailing list at thecurbsiders.com forward slash knowledge food to get our weekly show notes in your inbox. We are committed to providing you with high value practice changing knowledge. And to do that, we need your feedback. So please subscribe, rate and review the show on iTunes or contact us at thecurbsiders at gmail.com. And I'm so proud of myself that I reached out to the team ahead of time so I can actually thank the people who are helping out because we have a great team and they all help us behind the scenes on the episodes and we don't usually get to thank them on air. So special thanks to Elena Gibson for helping with our show notes, Beth Garbatelli for helping with our infographic and Kate Grant for helping with our cover art. And to our whole social media team, Hannah R. Abrams on Twitter, Beth Garbs Garbatelli on Instagram and Chris the Chubanchu on Facebook. Until next time, I've been Dr. Molly Hoyblein. And I've been Dr. Matthew Frank Watto. And I wanted to, uh, we always forget to do this, but I wanted to thank Dr. Stuart Kent Brigham for uh, writing our theme music, which you could probably hear playing right now in the background. And uh, to Paul Williams, wherever he is, uh, have a good night. Good night. <laughs>